life of contradictions. How long shall we continue to deny equality in our social and economic life? If we continue to deny it for long, we will do so only by putting our political democracy in jeopardy. Democracy is contingent on certain minimum guarantees where free citizens can genuinely claim control over the circumstances of our own lives. First, it must routinely produce consensus decisions or consensual decisions without arbitrary or unfair imposition of power. Second, citizens must participate in civil and political discourse and have an interest in it. This is a social world where their moral status of citizens is acknowledged, a world which is structured to enable their freedom and serve their interests. Third, citizens must associate with each other, not only as competitors, but in a relationship of reciprocal recognition and mutual respect. However, this consensus, discourse, and association can only happen where democracy acts towards the ends of uprooting social hierarchies and prejudices. For all citizens to feel free in a democracy, the state must side with a weaker population, which may be a numerical or social minority. This may at first appear to be at odds with the democratic principle of majority rule. However, a mere rule by majority can be established by many forms of government. The beauty of a democracy is the sense of moral status with which all citizens can participate in a country and the consensus in its decision making. In a democracy, the majority will have its way.
they are starved and later slaughtered. Similarly, though it was the idea of snowball, another thing to establish a windmill to ease the workload of the animals, Napoleon takes credit for the idea, thus distorting the truth. Orwell ends the fable with the message, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Why were the seven commandments not sufficient to protect the rights of animals? The governance in Manor Farm fell apart because there were no entrenched rules or institutions for governance. The lack of such rules led to an arbitrary exercise of power, radically altering the very contents of rights themselves. By its very nature, a democracy may be guided by the constitution, but its force must be driven from the morality inherent in constitutionalism. The rights given by the constitution are always at the risk of becoming a parchment guarantee if the constitution does not establish a structure that effectively checks the exercise of power and abuse of it. It is therefore imperative for citizens to engage in a dialogue with each other and with the legislative and executive arms of the state, the practice of constitutional values and organic reorientation of societal practices is essential to achieving the constitutional vision. Active participation by the citizenry in the democratic process in ways that are not expressly mentioned in the constitution, but are nonetheless implicit in the constitutional structure is indispensable to realize the constitutional rights. Essential to this are structures that enable citizenry participation. An informed electorate is a choosing electorate. Without such information, a lot of what we say about the power in the vote of the people would just be meaningless. Would a citizen be a contributor to the democratic process or a passive observer depends on their access to relevant information and their ability to not only consume it but to engage with it. This engagement and debate lie at the core of what we call a participative democracy. A participative democracy simply entails a democracy that operates on and promotes deliberation. This deliberation emerges not only from the need to secure the right to speech and expression, but also publicly engage with the ideas and enable transformation. It is rooted in the very conception of democracy and it liberates a democracy from its majoritarian impulses. While the right to free speech entails truth, discovery, and self-fulfillment of the citizen, its primary purpose is critical interaction and debate. There are overlaps, but in the context of a democracy, the relevance of free speech lies in deliberation with the uncomfortable aspects of our realities. If a democracy cannot safeguard discourse around the needs of all its people, it falls short of its promise. Thus, in order to resolve the discontent, a democracy must begin by hearing the voices of the people. For instance, India's official Oscar entry in 2018, Newton, told the story of a government clerk who was deployed in a remote insurgency ridden, ridden village in Chhattisgarh on election duty. The story of his many maneuvers to have people exercise the simple right to vote is an uncomfortable truth as much as it is a creative exercise. What it also does is show that the heart of a democracy lies in people willing to participate and register their voices and the framework that it takes for people to exercise its will. While free speech is in and of itself a whole universal discussion, I intend to speak of its discursive purpose in a democracy. As I said earlier, a democracy continues to be one where the electorate is informed and has both access to and influence over its governing bodies. A discursive democracy creates a fertile ground for deliberation which is inclusive 
and well built. Its institutions must ensure that everyone can engage in a discourse on equal terms and no force except that of better argument interrupts such an engagement. I will illustrate this by tracing how deliberation underlines our democracy from its very inception in the Constituent Assembly. The framers of the Constitution were tasked with stitching together the fragments of the country as they found it into a democracy. The Constitution has endured over the seven decades and has been internalized both by the masses and by the elites. It has provided the basis for limitations on ambitious executives and provided a language of politics for various groups in society. However, there were several imperfections in the conditions in which the Constitution was enacted or adopted. First, there was the colonial legacy of poverty, illiteracy and social division, which left many to be skeptical of the survival of India as a pluralistic society governed by a democratic constitution. The endurance of the constitution to this day is thus quite uncharacteristic in a society like ours, as someone would say. Second, the cause of this endurance can hardly be its perfect opposition. The constituent assembly did include a diverse set of members, but it was predominantly the majority of them upper caste, male, urban exercise. In a very recent book, Achut Chetan, a book about the founding mothers of the constitution, writes that while they did play a formative role in envisioning a modern universe for the women of the country, their narratives as well as the history of their contributions were largely subsumed by the dominant, quote unquote, founding fathers narrative. A term we almost subconsciously adopted in our gendered vocabulary to represent the framers of the Constitution. So, if not its inclusive composition, what exactly explains the continued relevance of the Constitution to our lives? The answer lies in its discursive composition, as well as discursive potential. Its composition aside, the process of its framing was an inclusive exercise based in discursive democracy. The constitution owing to this inclusive process resonated with the people of the country and created windows of engagement with its discontents. This is precisely the reason for its entrenchment here, the ability to promote debate and deliberation. Instances of debates from the constituent assembly demonstrate how deliberations that led to that lead to decisions impact our lives just as much, if not more, than the outcomes. For instance, despite Mahatma Gandhi's insistence, local self-governance was not made a part of the governing structure of the constitution, but were relegated to the non-enforceable directive principles of state policy. This was the result of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar's understanding of the Indian society as deeply fragmented Along the lines of caste, local self-governance in such context would have only created a legal structure that was rooted in the social reality of inequality and discrimination. However, after the failure to meaningfully engage with our rural populations through many top-down efforts, the 73rd Amendment to the Constitution fell back on the principles that were earlier considered unfit and reintroduced through local self-governance. We can argue if this change was reflective of the altered social reality or merely responded to the administrative intervenience and also whether Dr. Ambedkar's fears were adequately addressed. But the point I make is simply that the outcome earlier described at the birth of the constitution in one deliberative exercise was altered based on the debates that 
the Constitution, while firmly anchored in principles of social justice, responds to changing social realities. This is because we have a record of the debates that transpired in the process of its making. A legitimate debate, which proceeds from a desire to learn and to expand the public discourse on the subject, is relevant precisely for this reason. The process of reaching outcomes is far more important than the outcome. Decision. 
ensure that the people are willing to accept, engage with, and hopefully alter one day a deliberated outcome affords legitimacy to the institutions of governance. It is the difference between a defeated idea and a disenfranchised democratic partisan. While a defeated idea may eventually erode with time, a disenfranchised democratic participant militates against the very foundations of a deliberated engaging constitution. And that truly reflects the spirit of our polity and the constitution. In a diverse democracy, it is quite likely that certain opinions are heftier for reasons other than their intrinsic merit. There will of course be outcomes that are favorable to some more than others. If we truly manage to incorporate all streams of ideas into our decision-making processes, that by itself will not lead to outcomes that are acceptable to every part of society. The answer lies in what these outcomes represent. Deliberative democracy entails the ability of all individuals subject to a collective decision to engage in authentic deliberation about that decision. While deliberation sustains a democracy, dissent nourishes democracy. If democracy means that the views of one section of our society prevail, then it necessarily implies that a deliberating and eventually a dissenting minority. And this can at times be more powerful than an unthinking society ruled by a slogan, a servile and subservient population guarantees immediate democracy. There is an Urdu couplet by Sarshal Sailan which says, Chaman mein iktilaq e rang ko gu se baar bandhi hai, hum hi hum hai, to kya hum hai, tum hi tum ho, to kya tum ho. Justice Khanna's lone dissent. 
Hussain in ADM Jabalpur versus Shifkan Shukla warned against the perils of accepting executive excesses into the fundamental life of society during the course of the emergency. Ultimately, these dissents, like all dissents, were not only speaking to the times in which they were written, they were speaking to the future. Dissent in a democracy, even those which are unpopular and unacceptable, give us windows <coughs> to the future. And they are ultimately windows to our own soul. Lessey versus Ferguson was overruled by the American Supreme Court in Brown versus World <coughs> Education. And ADM Jabalpur versus Shishman Shukla was overturned in KS Kutaswami versus the United as we conclude this memorial event, I hope that the young minds that participated in this event continue to be committed to the values of the Constitution which cultivate a culture of democracy, debate, and dissent. These are the sustaining pillars of our society, and I only hope for the future and my appeal to the young generation. based on 